Sonic the Hedgehog Speed is fundamentally flawed and is arguably the most difficult concept to design a game around. In most games, developers can spend ample time ensuring that the levels players travel through are up to par, and that's because most characters move at a reasonable pace. This allows for the designers to create smaller, more focused worlds that the player can take their time traveling through. Sonic, however, is not so accommodating. The amount of level that Sonic can blast through in 10 seconds would take most platformers much longer to complete, meaning that in order to deliver a fulfilling gameplay experience, the developers have to make their levels a lot larger in order to compensate for just how fast Sonic blitzes through them. This has been a problem that's plagued Sonic games since the very beginning, and it's why, I argue, their quality tends to be so inconsistent in the first place. Sega has most certainly recognized the issue Sonic Speed presented from the very beginning and has employed four unique approaches since the series' inception to tackle this problem the best they can. The first and most common method they've done is introducing a style of gameplay that's a lot slower. They did this with Sonic Adventure's Amy, Big, and Gamma. Each one's gameplay style is much slower than Sonic's, Big especially, dear god. With them, the team could relax and design smaller levels for their now longer game. If this title was filled to the brim with only Sonic levels, then you'd be done with it in an afternoon. It'd certainly be a nice afternoon, but an afternoon nonetheless, a fate I'm certain Sega wanted to avoid. The treasure hunting and mech stages from Sonic Adventure 2 fall victim to this fix as well, with players forced to poke around every inch of Knuckles' levels trying to find hidden gems and having to control Tails' sluggish mech. While there's definitely fun to be had with both forms of gameplay, there's no doubt that their existence served as a huge weight off the developers' backs since all Knuckles needs is a small arena for his level and Tails can do with tight spaces. Silver stages from Sonic 06 speak for themselves. This hedgehog is a lot slower than the other two and leaves a lot to be desired in terms of movement. What's probably the most clear example of this fix, though, would be what Sonic Unleashed did. The daytime half of this game has Sonic blasting through set pieces faster than ever. The levels are enormous, long, and must have taken an incredible amount of time to craft, especially with how much polish they have. The nighttime half of this game, instead, had the astronomically slower Werehog, where you would beat up enemies, solve puzzles, and do a little platforming in smaller levels. You may find these alternative gameplay styles enjoyable, and sure, I find some of them fun too, but the focus here is getting to the bottom of why they and other design decisions in Sonic games exist in the first place, as I feel this will help people better understand the difficulty that comes with making a Sonic game. The second method Sega's employed is to go all in with speed gameplay, but we reuse level assets or have players replay levels entirely to make up for how much time they lose on designing these large levels. Sonic Heroes heavily reuses level assets, where every team travels through the same stages albeit with some differences like the mission-based objectives with Team Chaotix or more edits to the stage to make them harder, like with Team Dark. Think about the Tails and Knuckles levels from Sonic Adventure. The former is going through Sonic's levels, albeit in a different gameplay style via flying. The latter travels about an enclosed space found in Sonic's levels. Shadow the Hedgehog requires the player to replay some of the exact same stages multiple times in a row to reach the true ending. The most egregious example being Westopolis, which the player must beat 10 times for full game completion. I understand that you can pick a different objective when replaying a level, but the point I'm making here is that you're ultimately traveling through the same stage, even if you happen to see a couple new things now and again based on what mission you picked. Sonic Mania, to a lesser extent, reuses level assets as well, considering most of its levels are taken from the classic era. The difference here is that, unlike Sonic Heroes, Mania will drastically alter how a level is played, creating something fresh out of what they recycled, which I find to be the ideal way to go about this method. Old, but new. The third method is to go all in with speed gameplay, but dial back Sonic's speed or dial back the environment he's in. Take Sonic Colors for instance, it doesn't have any alternative slower gameplay styles, nor does it make you play the same level twice, but oftentimes the devs will force you to play some levels out in 2D so that they don't have to break their backs making all these 3D levels. There are even a few auto-scrolling levels. Yeah, an auto-scroller in a Sonic game, can you believe that? I feel bad for colors here because it's clear that the devs wanted to give players what they desired, a Sonic game where all the levels were like the daytime half of Sonic Unleashed, but unfortunately these levels lack the same polish that the Unleashed levels had. Sonic
Sonic Lost World is similar, but instead of retaining Sonic's high speed in 3D sections like in Unleashed or Colors, the devs decided to try and slow Sonic down overall so that the levels wouldn't need to be as big. And while this doesn't sound like a bad idea, their execution was doomed the moment they required players to press down and hold a button to make Sonic run, a design decision that should not have made it past the testing phase. Other 3D Sonic games that focus solely on speed gameplay without having to replay the same levels would be Sonic and the Secret Rings and Sonic and the Black Knight. But the issue with these titles, their controls aside, is that Sonic's movement is rather stiff, automated, and limited to a thin lane the entire time, which is a far cry from what many fans love about the more thrilling boost sections in Unleashed and more explorative sections from the earlier 3D titles. The fourth and final method Sega's employed is to make a Sonic game fully speed-based with no strings attached. This is where you'll find a lot of the classic titles, where they're a simple matter of going fast through a game that consistently presents you with new and fresh levels. Taking the time to deliver on Sonic's promise of speed is probably in part what why Sonic 3 and Knuckles is so well regarded. Everything is fast, everything is new, and you don't feel like the game's trying to reel you back. It even lets you play as three characters, of which all three move at the same exhilarating speed as Sonic, complete with their own unique abilities on top of that. Contrast this with the games that follow Sonic 3 and Knuckles, where characters other than Sonic feel less like they're fulfilling the speed the series is known for, and more like they're meant to serve as padding. Sonic Forces is hard to play in the category. It lets you play as three characters, all of which move from point A to point B in record time, and it doesn't make you play the same level twice, so you think it'd be in the same spot as Sonic 3 and Knuckles, but on the other hand, the avatar is a little slower than Sonic, and the game does reuse Green Hill and Chemical Plant. Despite these parts, I do think that forces would best be placed in this fourth category of Sonic games, albeit not the best fit. But that does beg the question, if this game managed to avoid most most of the padding problems that other titles suffered from, then why is it heavily criticized? Because 1. It lacks the polish that the speed sections from early titles had, and 2. Even if it was well polished, it's an incredibly short game with much less content compared to its predecessors, leaving it as an untapped well of potential that will unfortunately be remembered as a failure despite attempting to take a step in the right direction. Sonic Frontiers, however, is a different story. In the overworld, it doesn't have any alternative slower gameplay styles, it doesn't force you to replay any levels, and it doesn't greatly reduce Sonic's speed nor limit his environment. If anything, it's quite the opposite considering the overworld you're given. And unlike Forces, Sonic's controls here feel tight, responsive, and just overall fantastic, arguably the best he's ever been. And if you don't vibe with how Sonic moves here, you have the option to edit his controls, something I very rarely see in games and wish there was more of. Does this mean the Frontiers figured out the formula? No, but it's clear close, it still suffers from a few of the issues that the other categories present, mainly in the cyberspace levels. And here, you can forget about the fluid controls you experience in the overworld, cause now Sonic is heavier and stiffer, especially in 2D sections where his top speed is slow and his boost is more like an air dash. These levels are also completely content with reusing assets from previous titles, considering that they come in four visual flavors. Green Hill Zone, Chemical Plant, Sky Sanctuary, and Eternal Highway, with only the last one being original. This alone wouldn't be a bad thing. Sonic Generations and Sonic Mania do this. They take the aesthetics of previous games and make something new with them. Except, Cyberspace often doesn't make something new with these old aesthetics and instead copies entire level layouts from previous titles. Here's City Escape from Sonic Adventure 2, Dragon Road from Sonic Unleashed, and Chemical Plant from Sonic Generations to name a few of the majority of levels that are reused. Yes, there are some changes to these levels, and yes, you aren't going through them in the exact same gameplay style as the originals, but I don't think that the difference in movement here is significant enough for me to give them a pass. Like, look at Sky Sanctuary here from Sonic & Knuckles. Get a feel for it. The bridges, the clouds, the little teleporter that goes boom. You know, it's pretty cool, right? Look at this! Look at this! It's in 3D! It's an HD, you're boosting through it 
incredible speeds, the soundtrack is remixed, there's brand new set pieces, it's just crazy! The differences in cyberspace levels on the other hand are just not enough for me to give them a pass. And look, I get it, they're smaller levels and there's a lore reason for why they're like this. But at the end of the day, I'm going through levels I've already been through with not enough differences to keep me engaged, and I feel like Sega could have cooked them with a different recipe for a little more spice. But if I think all this is the case, then why don't I put Sonic Frontiers in the second category of Sonic games meant for the titles that reuse assets? Because doing so would be ignoring a huge part of what Sonic Frontiers is, that being the overworld. Honestly, none of the islands really speak to me aesthetically or spark my imagination in any meaningful way, but I greatly respect that Sega crafted a Sonic game where the main gameplay loop is a no-strings-attached playground where you get to unleash Sonic speed and run to your heart's content without the drawbacks that other titles have been criticized for. It's for this reason that I think Sonic Frontiers is getting a lot of praise. It understands what made Sonic great in the first place and expanded upon that with lots of neat obstacles and high-octane combat. With many failed attempts at remedying the issue of Sonic speed set firmly in the past, Sonic Frontiers gives us hope for this franchise's future. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Take care.